special guest today, all the way from Boston in America, is David Meerman Scott. Many of you would be aware of David as the as a professional speaker, been out to Australia a, a few times, um, but also the best-selling author of a number of um, books, uh, notably the seminal work called The New Rules of Marketing and PR, but also other, other books, Worldwide Rave, uh, Marketing Lessons from the Grateful Dead, News Jacking, <laughs> uh, and the real-time uh, real marketing and PR. So uh, welcome, David. Hey, thanks. It's really good to be here. It's been a while since I've been down to Australia. I'd like to get myself back, but um, uh, always nice to speak to my mates down in Australia. David, um, you've just launched a the fourth edition of the marketing and sorry, the new rules of marketing and PR book. Um, that's three over three hundred thousand sold already. Um, Twenty five languages. Uh, it's the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> yeah, and as an author, you would know that, right? Um, it is, um, it's been pretty remarkable, actually. The first edition came out in... And I actually was writing it in 2005 and in 2006. So um, it originally came out in 2007, and now we're on to the fourth edition. And... Um, you know, there's a number of reasons why it's done well. I think um, I, I chose a clever title. Yeah. Um, the New Rules of Marketing and PR, I think, really does a good job at describing what the book's about. But also, I think I was fortunate that I was early. Yes. Um, because the book came out in 2007, it was one of the very first books on, um, on how to uh, use the tools of the web um, for marketing and PR purposes, and um, and a lot of people, like you in particular as well, a lot of people were kind of playing around with these ideas, but no one had buckled down and done a book about it. So in a way, I was kind of lucky that I was first. Yeah, well, here's the there's the original, and there's the new one, and look at the thickness. <laughs> but I just I just dug out yeah. the, I just dug out the original, and I I looked at a. Um, a bookmark, and it's from uh, the Malthouse Theatre, seat B8, and it was 2007, <laughs> August yeah, 2007. No. So it must have been one of the early ones. The original one there is a bit of a bit of a collector's item, and <laughs> you know what's what's really interesting, Trevor, is that um, that the 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 strategies in the book have not changed. You know, if you were to read through that, that early edition, the, the, the first edition, um, the strategies that I talk about and that you talk about that we all, you know, that, 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 that we know work about creating content on the web, about getting your information out there, about engaging with your audience, those things haven't changed. What's changed for us are some of the tools that we can use. And way back in 2005 and 2006, when I was writing this book, you know, some of the tools that we did have in place were blogging, and you were blogging then, I was blogging then. Um, we had, um, but we did not have Twitter because it didn't exist when I was writing the first edition. Facebook at that time was only for students. Yeah. MySpace, interestingly, was had four times the number of users as Facebook did back then. Mm. Um, we had this weird thing called Second Life that some people were on. Uh, and <laughs> yeah, remember that? I'd, um, like to, I'd like Second Life to come. Is it still around? Because I mean, I guess broadband's a little bit better. It was very clunky in those days. It was really clunky then. I think now, now I, I don't know if it's still around, but in in the last say two years, nobody's ever mentioned it to me. So no, no, I, rem I actually that. removed, I actually removed that from the book. And I used to have a big section on MySpace, and now it's really small. <laughs> um, but some of the things, you know, the, some of the things that, that I added through the various editions, um, Google plus became, you know, became big Instagram didn't, didn't exist in the, in the, in the, the newest edition um, the, the things that are new, Google+, Instagram, Pinterest, uh, and then I have a, a chapter on this idea of newsjacking. Yeah, so uh, which the whole is, visualization of the, of the social web. Yeah, yep. So, so um, 
again, I think it's really interesting that that the strategies have not changed, that you could read the strategy parts of the book in any edition and it'll be essentially the same as what I talk about. But in, in terms of, um, I guess, the take-up, so in those earlier days, um, you know, particularly, well, certainly in Australia, but even in America, um, a lot of pushback on the ideas. <clears throat> how how accepted are you now? Are you, are you a heretic or are you uh, <laughs> just a... Um, you're the, the godsend. What's where, where you know, you, because your journey from that point, you were talking and speaking uh, and, and interacting and consulting in those earlier days, and you've continued to do that. But obviously, um, you know, acceptance of your ideas has has grown over that period. Yeah, you know, that's also been pretty remarkable. Um, in the early days, um, the you know, the powers that be, the um, uh, people who worked in big agencies executives that work in big companies, um, also institutions like the Public Relations Association of America, for example, um, they were actively dismissive of the ideas in the book. You know, I would have people from agencies who would sit there with their arms crossed and stare at me like I was crazy when I would talk about some of these ideas. And I had people who wrote about book and wrote about me in the early days as being, um, you know, this is just a fad. It's not going to be sustainable. You know, um, all of these sorts of things. And now um, everybody recognizes that there's something there. Everybody recognizes that that there are some fundamental truths. I mean, one fundamental truth is that when people have a problem, the first place they go are the search engines. Mm. That's a fact. You can't dispute that anymore. Um, the second thing that you can't dispute is that human beings now are communicating with each other through the tools of online, right. you know, whether it's on their mobile devices or social networks, and in particular, um, more people in the world have a mobile phone than have access to working toilets. More people in the world have access to mobile phones than have electricity. So I don't think, I, I, I have very little pushback now on the general idea that we're going through a communications revolution and that the ways that humans are communicating are different and that therefore marketers and communicators need to embrace the idea of how to reach people online. That part now, after, after seven years, finally that part has become understood by the vast majority of, of people. But what most people still struggle with is the ways to create the kind of information that will serve to as marketing and PR um, value for them. In particular, it's a huge struggle for me even now to get people to stop talking about products and services on their blogs and on their websites and instead try to focus on what's going on with their buyers and how, to, how they can create content that's valuable, that serves a purpose, that, that um, solves problems for people. That's still a big leap. You know, there's still a lot of organizations that are so focused on talking about what it is that they, that they have a very big difficulty trying to understand how they could be an informational resource instead. So it's f fair to say, say that in the earlier days, it was probably more around the blogging and the personal publishing. Um, you're famous for the quote, you are what you, you publish, which I, I still think stands the test of time today. In fact, it's probably more relevant today than ever. Because I think, yeah, I, I think it's a lot. actually Everyone, probably... Everyone's publishing a lot. But, but I guess the whole, over that seven-year journey, the social networks and the, and the voracious uh, uptake thereof by the public is, is just meant that that now you're 
publishing con now you can publish content, but it's it's going the potential to go viral. But there is that knock on effect, that ripple effect of the the sharing, and then therefore it's about building us, I guess, a community of fans and followers and advocates and supporters for your brand who can then um, pass that material on, pass your own, your content on. Yeah, it's in, that's an interesting observation you've made, um, Trevor. Because yes, in the in the early days, what we had available to us were was blogging. Um, we had the ability to create YouTube videos. That was quite early. Yep. We also had the ability to push to push content out on our websites, yep. um, and, and I, you know, that's always that's been around for a long time. Uh, did not have until more recently where that was the whole social networking thing. So I think that what's been interesting now is that with the rise of social media, uh, with particular tools like Facebook and Twitter and others, uh, Instagram, Foursquare, other ones, um, what a lot of people tend to think is, okay, you know, these ideas about marketing and public relations are the ideas of only social networking mm. and they want to make it I'm sure you're seeing this in your um, experience as well they they kind of bypass these what they might think are kind of old-fashioned ideas of having a great content rich website of having um, really um, a great blog of how videos can be effective form of marketing and public relations and instead a lot of people want to jump right into the social networking aspect oh I need a Twitter feed I'm gonna focus on Twitter I gotta learn about hashtags I'm gonna create this feed and I'm gonna get onto Foursqu uh, Foursquare and I'm gonna get onto Facebook mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and that's, that's good I mean I'm glad that people want to do that but what really works is what you do, what I do, what a lot of brands do, which is create something valuable on the web and then use the social channels as a way to share, use the social channels as a way to engage. But simply doing the social channel, it typically isn't enough for most brands. Yeah, and it's um, I, I like to call sort of blogging and the podcasting the traditional social media. <laughs> it's <laughs> such true. a beast. Um, I, I'm sort of been toying Tradition, around with traditional social media. I got to write that down. <laughs> the traditional and, social and media. Quote, quote you for it. I'm getting my little pad of paper here. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, what I'm finding also with content, and and you're right, the sort of now, um, you know, they've all a lot of the companies have jumped onto the the, the tools or well, the networking tools, but then realised well, what have we got to um, to distribute and to to get people to share and there's. Even dissecting the content further, there is that you know whole utility-based um, content that's useful, um, information-based, how-to, instructional, um, you know, solves people's needs. Um, but also, I think there's there's times when there's good to do thought leadership material. And that's probably my PR background coming out, which might not be that helpful. Might be more of a poke in the eye, but relevant and gets people thinking about a certain topic or issue. And then I also like talking about human content just to segment it out a bit so people can, you know, organizations can take people behind the, uh, behind the velvet rope of a, of a company or an organization and, um, yeah. and, and personalize it and, and humanize it a lot more. And I know that that's a, that's an area that you're massive on as well. Right. Well, you know, when I think about how people solve problems, you know, there's a number of ways that they solve problems. One way is they search. You know, they go to Google or another search engine, they type in a phrase and they see what pops up. So, perspective, an organization that has good content and, you know, I, lo I love this traditional social media phrase that you just, that you just said. Uh, if they're creating good traditional social media, then frequently that'll pop up high in the search engine results. If they're doing thought leadership, it sounds like an old-fashioned phrase now, but it's still a, a valuable way to describe creating great content if they're doing thought leadership. That's likely to pop up in the search engine results. The other way that people find content is that they ask their friends and their colleagues, colleagues and their family members for advice. They, you know, hey, I need to get, I need to go to Sydney, Australia, um, in a, in a couple of weeks. Do you have a recommendation for a hotel? 
and frequently that's done through social networks. Um, and so, um, so that becomes another aspect of how brands can get their ideas out there. Um, but I think that as people and, and making sure that they're focused on getting in front of people through social, they kind of forget about that longer term, deep and rich um, linked content and they don't spend as much time on the longer form content on the videos on the blog posts on the ebooks on the white papers because they're so focused on that short term content the fleeting stuff and I, and as you know I'm a huge believer in the idea of real time and the idea of instant engagement I interesting aspects of marketing and public relations right now is the idea that you can focus on exactly what's going on in the moment. You know, if, if one of your potential customers is searching right now, you know, you can serve up to them exact content they need. If, they're, um, if somebody is um, looking for you on Twitter and they've said, hey, I need a new uh, mobile phone or whatever it is, and you're, you're a mobile phone company, you can pop in and, and reach them right away. That's really interesting. But, but, but that doesn't help you so much when somebody is searching for something and yeah. content that in many ways is, is um, less sexy. You know, it's, it's a little more difficult to crank out the blog post than hang out on Twitter. And, and I, I think that's one of the things that I got from the book that, you know, if I, if I recall back to the first one, that those streams of um, the real-time nature um, yeah. is is omnipresent now um, and also that aspect of news jacking from a from a PR perspective being able to to lock into uh, not, a, not so much a trend but a, a news hit that's happening at that time and and, and and that comes back to real time so real time is a real is a is a, a big theme of, of of the new book isn't it like it yes yeah it, it just goes all the way it, it just pops up and down. It, yeah, it, it's it's a theme throughout the book. I have a, um, a specifically on real time marketing. I also have a jacking, and all of that stuff is new from two thousand seven. Yeah. the the thing The thing that is really, really fundamentally important that changed approximately two years ago that very few people are aware of is that Google used to take weeks or even months to index content. You know, when a post back in, say, 06, 07, 08, it wouldn't appear in the Google search results for months. The only way that we could find a new... You remember these days? And the only, yeah. days, that we, the only days that I could find out that Trevor had a new post is... If um, if I went to your blog and saw it, or if I had if I used Technorati or some other um, engine that indexed, but a, a a regular Google search wouldn't bring up your new content. And about it was about two years ago, maybe two and a half years ago. I forget my dates, but Google started indexing truly in real time. So my blog post that I write today is indexed today. Not only today, it's indexed within minutes. It's amazing. Yeah, I, and I, I hadn't ever really, you know, taken that into consideration, but now you say, yeah, that's, it's, it's certainly true. I think it's sort of just been happening as Google just keeps improving, improving, and um, yeah, that's, that's our situation today, and that helps with viral effect in a positive or a negative sense. It, yeah, and, and it, 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 there's so many reasons why that's important. And that's, that's where the light bulb in my, my brain went off around this idea of newsjacking because as a PR technique, um, you know, we PR people have been hitching our ideas to stories um, for a long time. That's not new. You know, the idea of, um, of if there's a news story that's already existing that we have a, something to say about it that we can get quoted in the press, that's not new. But what's new in the idea of newsjacking is that we now can create a piece of content, typically a blog post, yeah. 
that as soon as we finish it, it's available for all the reporters to find, it's available for all the consumers to find, and as a result, the ways that we can get our information into the marketplace are completely different. You used to have to and say, hey, I'm going to raise my hand now, I'm an expert in this topic. Yep. Now, we write a blog post, we get it out there, when the journalists are searching, they find it. They can find it, yeah, it's, it's, and, a, it's um, a big development. And, and it's, a, and it's a really, really, really big development. And I think that's, um, but it's sort of a kind of an illustration in my mind about how real time and instant engagement and the always on world that we live in now. I like to draw the, the um, analogy of a bond trading desk. You know, I, I, I lived through a weird transitional phase in the bond markets in my very first job when computers revolutionized um, bond trading and trading rooms um, in the early 1980s because all of a sudden we had access to real-time data and real-time news on everybody's desk. Hmm. Transition is happening right now for every single person on the entire planet. We all have access to instant news. We all have access to instant data. We have all have access instantly to what our friends are doing. I, you know, I asked my, my daughter is 20 years old, and I said, you know, what if somebody changes their Facebook status to say they now have a boyfriend or girlfriend, how long does it take for you to know that? And it's like, well, that's a stupid question. It takes a second. Oh, I know. You know? And so all of her friends, if one of her friends changes her status and says, I've got a new boyfriend or girlfriend, you know, everybody in her circle knows in a second that they've, that that's happened. And think about the difference that that would have been, say, two or three years ago when they had to get on the phone and call each other or text each other or, um, or find out in the hallways of the school. So, and, 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 you know, each one of these things are just a, means that we communicators, we marketers, we PR people need to change our mindset yeah. about how we're communicating because of all these real-time ideas. There's some traps for, for new players in that. I, I recall a, a friend of mine who's a little bit older than me and he had his Facebook page and he was just updating it and he actually added in that he was married. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> And everyone says, oh, I always thought you were. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you, yeah. You've yeah. never been married. You didn't invite me to the wedding. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, funny. A um, couple of other, just quickly, I want to cover a couple of things. Uh, you rail against the whole notion of corporate um, jargon and gobbledygook. Um, and, and obviously, you know, companies have always, you know, written about themselves or about their products and, and therefore... A lot of that jargon comes out because of that, and you know we only have to look at old old school brochures to uh, to realise how bad that's been, and probably some are still doing it. But are you seeing a relaxing of the language a little bit when it comes to to, um, to blogging and to these new, new new mediums? Are they changing the way uh, companies are, are writing and becoming a bit more relaxed and and, and conversational? I think I think there is a little bit of relaxing. I think that most blogs are pretty casual. I think that most Twitter feeds are, are done pretty casually. But I think that most corporate websites and a lot of brochures are still too formal. That's particularly true in the business-to-business -business space with technology companies. Um, you know, that's particularly true, although it is true of all organizations. You know, the words that pop up continuously world-class, cutting-edge, mission-critical, innovative or innovative, depending on how you de de um, pronounce it. Um, these words just, you know, come up again and again and again, and they're so overused that they have no meaning anymore. Yeah. So, you know, an organization that says we're world-class, mission-critical, cutting-edge, innovative, are actually saying nothing because everyone uses those words. Yeah. And... Um, and I think that it's still a really big problem. And it's relate, there's a related problem of um, what I call visual gobbledygook, which is the use of, 
uh, you know, models to represent uh, people who work at companies and also stock models to represent um, customers of companies. And I think that's a big mistake. In, the, in a world of social networking where there's over a billion people on Facebook and we can see their pictures, for a company to use stock models to represent their customers, I think is a really big mistake. And a lot of companies still do that. I think they need to use real pictures of real people to, sh to humanize their organization. Because um, all of those pictures of people in call centers looking very, very happy and, and coiffed and well made up, etc., they're all that's what that's what all call centers people look like, of course. Yeah, right. And <laughs> and then you know I, I've seen examples where one organization uses a model in their call center, and there's another organization who has the exact same picture, that exact Shit. same picture. <laughs> You know, that says, here's my customer services rep. So um, that, that's the danger. And, and I think it's more than that. I think that we consumers don't even see those models anymore because we, we, we process them in our brain as just advertising. It's just stuff that goes in the eye and, and doesn't get processed because we recognize it for what it is. It's a stock model. Visual gobbledygook, I like that. Um, and brand journalism is another term that uh, you've popularized and um, and the whole notion of journalists now being employed by companies to go in and dig up stories, tell stories, um, you know, create content, whether it's, you know, video or written word or audio. Um, how's that trend rolling out in, um, in the States at the moment? Actually, here in the U.S., it's re it's it's become remarkably popular. I'm I'm really I'm really excited actually about the number of organizations that are actually doing it, and it's kind of it's kind of scary in a way. I mean, I'm, we're among friends, you and me, Trevor. So I'll tell you this, but um, uh, uh, and anyone who's listening in will hear it. But um, you know, in in my in my work, I, I I kept saying, you know, hire journalists, hire journalists, hire journalists. The best people to create content are people who know how to tell a story who are typically journalists. You know, avoid having um, a, an advertising copywriter create your content for you. Hire a journalist instead. And there's hundreds of companies that are taking me up on this and actually doing it. And it's kind of frightening, you know. It's like I can't believe that these organizations are actually doing it. And I've had people who work for some of the biggest brands in the world tell me, I read this stuff in your book and I'm doing it now. And it's kind of like, oh my God, I hope it works, you know. <laughs> um, um, but, it, but it does. And, you know, one of the latest examples is um, Raytheon. Raytheon is a huge American defense contractor. They make missiles. They make um, all kinds of of, of hardware that's used by uh, by governments and um, their team of people that create the content for them are former journalists they have a former television producer from Canadian Broadcasting who runs the department they have a former Associated Press wire service reporter who won the Pulitzer Prize uh, who's um, working for them so um, that's the that's the right in my in my view that's the right people to be creating content because they're able to tell stories, they're, get, they're able to, to create content for a readership, for an audience, for consumers, and they get away from, from this advertising-centric approach that had been so popular for so long. And I suppose um, the changes that have to be made there are the company needs to loosen up and allow a journalist to do their thing, and the journalist probably has to... You know, particularly if they've come off an investigative <laughs> um, show or been, you know, a, ha a hard-nosed um, beat reporter that, you know, um, you're in a company, you're not, you know, you're still in the company. Um, go in and dig, dig for stories. But Yeah, um, I, think, I think those are two challenges. A couple of other challenges that I think um, are in this process. One is that a company that hires a journalist needs to understand that these people aren't just going to create product information. No, that's right. You have to let them find the story, and they'll find some great stories. Um, they're, Boeing, the aircraft manufacturer, does a great job with their brand journalism efforts. 
And the stories that they, that they come up with are remarkable. I mean, just an example, one of the reporters figured out that, that Boeing has um, access to one of the biggest refrigerators. Actually, it's a freezer, one of the biggest freezers in the world. It's actually big. And they put an airplane in there, and they lower the temperature down um, to below freezing, to do performance checks on how the airplane operates. And this, this, you know, it took a reporter to say, holy cow, there's a story here. Mm -hmm. And to do a video and write a text-based story and get that information out there. That refrigerated hangar had been there for a long time, but nobody thought that it was interesting until a reporter saw it. So you have to let the reporter do their job and get out there. The challenge is that the reporters themselves need to make the leap that brand journalism is still journalism. And a lot of reporters who have worked in um, mainstream media say, oh my gosh, that's going to the dark side. Yeah. You know, I, I, I don't want to work for a company because I'm, I'm, I'm selling my soul. Mm. Um, and that's not true. I mean, they're still a journalist. They happen to have a paycheck that comes from a company rather than uh, a newspaper or a magazine. <coughs> and I suppose as long as everyone's on the one page and that's that's always the mindset as as you always talk about is it's all about a mindset then um, you know that's that's the critical point okay um, well that's fantastic David um, I mean, congratulations on the book um, I know that um, yeah, every every bookstore I see in in uh, Melbourne and Sydney and given I've just got a book out I'm always looking at the bookstores and you're always there <laughs> nice um, nice. And, and, are, uh, are you, and I hope you're always there too. Uh, yes, it's starting to get out, which is good. Uh, it's funny with, with books, you know, when you, when you first release, you want to make sure that you're in, you know, every bookshop and, and uh, airport, etc. But then after a few months, you want to make sure that there's not too many left. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what I, what I learned a while ago, I'm sure you've learned it as well, is it's really books out there. But um, what really makes me happy is when I speak at a conference and there's 500 books or 200 books because every single person in the conference was, was given one by the conference organizer. Mm. So um, that, that, that's really uh, rewarding. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a little secret, um, again, because we're among friends. Do you know what reverse shoplifting is? No, I don't. <laughs> okay, so you know what shoplifting is when you steal something from a shop. Yeah. Uh, reverse, reverse shoplifting is when an author goes into the bookstore that doesn't carry their book, brings a copy and hi hides a copy, brings it in there, and then either puts it on the shelf so that someone will, will see it and then they'll go to buy it. Or, because what happens is you, you get a copy of your book you bring it up to the register, to the till, and you, you, you say, I want this book. And then they, they scan it with the barcode. But because they don't actually have that book in stock, all of these weird um, error messages pop up. And then, nobody, and then nobody can figure out why they don't have this book. And then eventually they say, well, we've got to order this book because it's here, but we don't actually have it. So let's place an order for some more copies. Um, it's called reverse reverse shoplifting, reverse and um, shoplifting. Uh, don't don't tell anybody where you heard about it from. No, I, would, <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't dare. It's uh, that is an interesting concept. Um, well, thanks very much, David. Yeah, and, my pleasure. Um, we look forward to seeing you. Are you due out in Australia at all, or? Uh, no, no plans now. But you never know. Um, I'm I'm hoping to get there again um, in the near future. Excellent. Well, congratulations again on the book, and uh, we'll continue to um, check out the blog uh, webinknow.com and um, keep following your journey. Thanks, Trevor, and same to you. Good luck with your uh, continuing success with your blog and your book and your business. Thanks. Okay, great. Take care.